Gracious Lord, gather us together. Open our hearts to you. Come even as you have promised, because we gather together in the name of your Son. And it is from your lips that we hear the words that when we gather in your name, you are here. So come, orchestrate this evening in accordance with your will and purpose. Open our hearts to that which you would desire to work both in us and through us. And so we do say, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I'd like to begin with a quote from probably the theological architect of, in all of Anglicanism, the Reverend Dr. Richard Hooker, who wrote these words. If truth is anywhere manifest, do not smother her with flattering delusions, but acknowledge her greatness and think it your best victory when she triumphs over you. Think it your best victory when she triumphs over you. I am utterly convinced that ordination is really not at all like an academic graduation. In an academic graduation, you are acknowledging accomplishments. You are celebrating a place of arrival, the conferring of a new degree, a new place of status in the life of the academic community, a new qualification for a job. This is not that. <laughs> It's just actually the opposite. It is, of course, a beginning, but I really believe with all of my heart that ordination is actually a cry of abdication. It is not a celebration of accomplishment. You see, to enter into this ministry, this servant ministry, you just have to give up. It's the acknowledgement that I am, though on paper qualified, as the liturgy says, for this order, qualification has much more to do with submission. Submission to Jesus Christ, the breaking of my will, being formed more into the image of a servant, the challenging at the, the very depths of I am and all of my desire for significance and for accomplishment and for status, the Lord just looks at it and cuts it at the knees and says, oh no, you're a servant. You see, the gospel truth, not just a diaconal ministry, but that which is expressed through diaconal ministry to the rest of the whole church is contained within this terribly uncomfortable line in the epistle reading. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. There are plenty of people who want to be in the ordained ministry for the sake of its status. And there actually was a time, in fact, perhaps not all that long ago, and still true in some parts of the world, that if you wear one of those, these collars that are always slightly uncomfortable, by the way, that it is a reminder somehow that you were in a place where people defer, they, they look up to you. Not so much in the United States. <laughs> Just the opposite. The sense is, is that if, you know, if you really can't make it in the real world, <laughs> then maybe you want to think about ordination. <laughs> I know some laugh, and it's this kind of sardonic laugh, but it's, it's really true. There, there are no perks. Those days are over. Instead, 
It's actually a lot of really very, very hard work. But not work inappropriate to the place of servitude, to the place of slavery. I mean, we blithely sing the hymns that we did tonight. And I want you to know that a part of those words actually sends a chill through my very bones. Not the least of which was the prayer attributed to St. Francis that we sung as our graduate. Jesus, our Lord, may we not seek to be consoled, but to console, nor look to, be, look to understanding hearts, but to look for hearts to understand. May we not look for love's return, but seek to love unselfishly. Really? In other words, my job is to basically lay aside my desire for that kind of self-fulfillment and to intentionally put myself in the crosshairs of human conflict where any kind of thing will come out of the mouth of a person pushed to the wall in anger where the kind of resentment that boils over, even when you're trying to do the right thing, will be held against you, perhaps for the rest of your life. I want that. Or more pointedly, you want that? Are you kidding? Understand that the call to servanthood it's, is by its very nature the call to be misunderstood to put yourself intentionally in harm's way, to do the thing that you think might be right, but it doesn't always pan out the way that you hope, to be able to pray fervently and occasionally by the mercy of God experience extraordinary breakthroughs, but other times you're just putting in the time because you know God will do things with your prayers that you can never do on your own, but it still may not work the way you like. Because after all, even prayer is not about mastery, it's being mastered. Reading the scripture is not so much allowing the scriptures to have their way in you so that you master them, but to allow them to have their way in you so that they master you. It's the place of servanthood. It is the place of abdication in the face of the authority of Jesus Christ. That is what Paul means at his very heart when he says, we do not proclaim ourselves. We're not here to make a name for us. Who is Lord? There's only one, and it's not me. It's Jesus. And therefore, all sacrifice is due him who sacrificed everything for us. Do you think he's just speaking in hyperbole when he says we are afflicted in every way but not crushed? perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, and then summing it all up in the most poignant of ways, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. This ain't easy. But is it right? Is it worth it? Are you, in fact, willing to be mastered? Because the glory of it is, is that we have a treasure, as Paul says. It is the very presence of the Holy Spirit, the very same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, dwelling within us. And it is exactly in those kinds of cross points where so much is demanded of us that we're not sure that we're going to make it, that it, to our shock and surprise, the Lord breaks in and begins to do something that never, ever could have been imagined, even in the very best of our prayers. And in the end, so that what happens is, is that in these extraordinarily impossible situations, God breaks through, God does what God wants to do in a way that can only cause us to go, it was you, not me. All glory to you. All glory to you. And the joy is you get to be in on it. You get to see God working in the lives of people in the most extraordinary ways, even as you sit with them in the places of deepest despair. Because 
I'm profoundly conscious that the Lord, the scripture's true when it says the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. Near to the brokenhearted. <laughs> we still want to hang out with the accomplished. If we can't get any glory for ourselves because of the status that we bear as clergy, at least we can do something by association, right? So we name drop and we talk about people that we know and we try to show up in the right homes and, and things like that so that at least there's a certain level of deflective glory or at least reflective on us maybe a little bit. Again, Jesus will have none of it. Absolutely none of it. it it's not that you avoid the posh house. But even in the posh house, you're there to be a servant. You're not there to make a name for yourself. You're not there to try to build associations that will somehow lift your own self-esteem or heighten your social status. That's vile in the eyes of God. Instead, if you are there as Jesus' servant and emissary, wherever you go, you are not to be mystified or have your head turned by wealth, social influence, or anything else that might pique your own selfish desire. You're there actually there to get your hands dirty, to sit with them in ways that others might not be able to, to listen carefully and, and with great discernment, and not allow the devil, and it's the devil, to distract you by material will, so you want to suck up rather than speak the hard truth, because if you don't do it, who will? I have come among you as one who serves, who serves. And it is in that precious place, because it is precious, of servanthood, that the light of the gospel that God has put in you will shine most brightly. That's what it means in the gospel to say, have your lamps lit, be dressed for action. That wherever you are, you are available for God to use you in any way that God opens the door for it to happen. Whether you like it or not actually is quite beside the point. Instead, it has everything to do with personal availability. To be a part of that is actually an extraordinary adventure. But it is not an adventure, sort of like Peter before he denies Jesus. Lord, we'll go anywhere that you will. That kind of pride got to, had to be dealt with. So of course, Peter got embarrassed. He denied Jesus. And you know the same thing happens to us. He will deal with our heroism just as clearly as he will deal with our sin. So that in the end, what happens is all we have, all we have, is our own abdication. Oh God, what do I have to give you? Come and master me, that I might be your servant. So I hope for you, I hope for you, that ordination is the raising of the white flag of abdication. <clears throat> Not my will, oh God. Yours be done. To be willing to be mastered by the scriptures <laughs> rather than you mastering them. To be mastered by the power of the Holy Spirit in prayer rather than you learning all the right techniques for a fruitful prayer life. <clears throat> that your eyes are open, that the lamp in you is lit, so that wherever you are, in someone's home, in church, at a restaurant, at the grocery store, at the convenience store, there is a part of you that is, now, Lord, now, what would you have me do? Because it gives you the most amazing surprises. What, one little story. Just last week, I got up late. I didn't have the prayer time that I should have. I'm throwing clothes on. I'm getting in the car, and I'm heading out to be able to get down there for an appointment. I'm hungry. There is nothing. There is no good restaurant between my house and the diocese office. <laughs> and so I'm getting close to literally the only place I can think of. And no disparagement, but it was a circle K. Not much there. But I really felt strongly, I mean strongly, that I should stop and I had my collar on and all that. So I pulled in and I'm browsing and 
trying to say, well, okay, do I get a granola bar or whatever? You know, what's possible? So I collect the little things that I'm gonna do. And I walk up to the convenience store counter and the woman says, I say to her, I said, I always do. How are you? I really mean it when I ask the question. And she said, well, I've been here since five in the morning. I said, good gracious, what time do you get up? She said, oh, I get up at three because I need to take the time to read the Bible before I get to work. And I said, oh, I understand that. I, I could use your prayers because I didn't get up all that early this morning in the way that I should. And within the, a matter of about two minutes, there was literally a divine encounter at the Circle K on Fern Creek. That's what I mean. It's about being available. And you see, if, if, if there had been a lot of pride inside of me where I wanted to be impressive, I never would have admitted that I didn't get up as early as I would have liked. But then I would have missed everything about what God wanted to do. That's a part of what it means to take the lowest place. There's a profound level of transparency about all of this. Or you're just you. Because that's all you've got. <coughs> Except for Christ. The hope of glory. And what is the glory? God doing things that only God can do that exalts Jesus as Lord. That's what Paul says here. He says, the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. So, beloved, raise the white flag. Kneel to receive and in the kneeling, say to God and to the whole church, I advocate, Jesus, please use me. And continue to say yes to the challenging, heartbreaking, surprising adventure of servanthood. And not just for yourselves, as a challenging witness to all of us in the church, that the diaconal ministry that you express might look more and more like the entire body of God.